All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us. Another episode of Catching Up with Jacob. And here he is, Jacob Prash. How are you, brother? Bless you, in Jesus. I'm hanging in there anyway. Keep hanging in there, brother. We're almost hanging done. Hanging in there. We're almost hanging done. Jesus, don't let go and he won't let go of you. Praise God. Amen. David Lister, how are you today down in the South? Doing well. It's been a busy day. So, already. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, Davey in Australia. Good morning. It's Saturday morning. Yep. Yeah. I can't believe a week's gone by already. It's good to be with you guys. Yeah. Good to see you. Saturday last night. Back again today. Praise God. Yeah, great study, too. Thank you, Mark. It was Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you, Davey. Thank you so much. Uh, Jay, down in the state of California, not too far from my house. Not at all. It's good to be here. It's good to be here with all my good buddies from Moriel. And I can't wait to dig into the many topics we've got. Oh, there's a lot of them today. Very exciting stuff. So, um, you know, got a lot of energy for this stuff because uh, it's it's nonstop. It's like an avalanche. Sometimes it feels like, uh, you know, the verbal diarrhea from the media company. But uh, we have to deal with that. Uh, but we are endeavored to preach the truth and, and, and share Jesus. Even through the news, we could see God's hand working through it. A lot of people just focus on what these uh, evil men and women are doing. But we want to know what God's doing and prepare God's people for what is coming. Jacob, uh, any announcements that you got going on? Anything coming up? Yes. Next month, we shall be in Borno in the Czech Republic. The details are on the Moriel website or on Moriel itinerary. Uh, our UK and Scottish conferences, basically England and Scottish conferences, I'll be joined by Tim Leach and Pastor Marco Quintana from California a chap you may have heard of. In the meantime, those are also on the available on the uh, website for your information. You can contact Beryl Hunter. The one in England is the 8th to the 10th of November, and the previous weekend will be in Gartmore in Scotland. The one in England will be at Yardfields in Staffordshire. So please go to the Moriel website, moriel.org, on the itinerary page, and you can book if you are in the UK. Also, this um, present month, on the 24th and 25th of August, on the 24th, I'll be with Pastor Tim Leach at Knowles Green Church in Preston. Preston. Again, visit the website for the precise uh, driving instructions on, to get there, and that'll be... Uh, a double session with myself and Tim Leach on the 24th. The following day, the 25th, I'll be with Pastor Mark Jackson at Hattersley Baptist Church in Hyde on the outskirts of Manchester, England. That'll be the Sunday morning, the 25th. All details, again, are on moriel, M-O-R-I-E-L dot org itinerary, or you can just do a search for Moriel itinerary. Look forward to seeing you. Amen. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, we want to welcome those who are watching live. And of course, we thank you for being with us. Welcome in the name of the Lord. And those who are going to watch later, thank you for watching. And um, share these videos and share them uh, with uh, friends, family, even your enemies. They need to know, too, what the Lord is doing, what the Lord is going to do. And he's coming. And that's what we proclaim. We also want to make sure that you understand that we uh, we have different platforms, and uh, not only not only from Morial TV, Morial TV uh, We're also on Facebook. We're also on YouTube. We're also on Vimeo. We're also on Twitter. We're also on Telegram, and of course, we are on Rumble. We thank Rumble so much for uh, having us, uh, giving us a lot of freedom and lots of latitude there. So lots of platforms that you can choose from. And of course, uh, we do want you to go to the ones that uh, Morial has, morialtv.org, morial.tv. And those are really good uh, to watch him on. And uh, well, of course, we have podcasts as well. And you can find all that information. Uh, we, we use Buzzsprout to uh, get the podcast from iTunes to uh, Spotify. And you can find all that information on, not only on morial.org, but also on YouTube, on our About channel. There's information there. Uh, but we also know that on Rumble specifically, there's been lots of lots of scammers, lots of copycats, lots of people pretending to be Morial Ministries. It gets really confusing. We've been uh, uh, noticing that, and we have um, uh, we have seen many channels come up. 
sometimes using the same same type of name, same close enough. Uh, we've used uh, seen them use our our logo. And uh, unfortunately, people get confused and they always ask, which one is your channel? Because there's so many of them. Well, to that extent, uh, Jay, I'm going to let Jay talk a little bit about this because uh, we want to warn you about these scammers, possible copycats, possible scammers, and uh, what they may be thinking of doing so you don't fall for it. So over to you, Jay. Oh, thank you, Marco. So I just wanted to warn everyone, there is someone on Rumble or maybe uh, multiple people that have used our logo to reply to comments that you're leaving on our Rumble channel. And they're giving out a cell phone number. First of all, let me explain that Memorial Ministries will never give you a private cell phone to, get, to, to contact us. You can find it at memorial.org. You can find emails there, contact information there. We will never leave it in a comment. Secondly, when you call this number or text this number, they will try to get you to invest in stocks, in cryptocurrency, or in silver. Morio Ministries will never ask you to invest in any type of commodity. And uh, lastly, um, the only time we will ever ask for money is for a special mission. We will never ask you for money for any other thing than missions. And that will always be through our website, morial.org. So please be aware of this. And unless you have, uh, unless you're sure that it's from the actual channel, please do not contact us. Please do not text us. Please don't call us. Unless you are contacting us through our emails that we publish on our website. That should uh, conclude everything. Very good. Thank you, Jay. And oh. uh, yeah, this is an ongoing problem. Go ahead. All right. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, Moriel's having a Thanksgiving conference down in Crystal River, Florida. Details are on the website. Uh, we have it at a hotel. There's rooms there. Uh, you can book through. You can get the information there. And I'm telling you in advance because... Uh, Chris, the Thanksgiving holidays tend to book up. So if you're interested, you'll see Tim Leach, Jacob, and a couple other speakers there. So please check it out on the moriel.org website. And to Jay's point, uh, there is definitely right. lots of hackers that um, are, are getting in and trying to create lots of problems and copycats and imitate things. So uh, please just keep yourself. I can't reiterate it anymore, uh, but it, it has to be said, and we need to be saying it probably over and over and over again because it's it's an ongoing problem. Other channels have the same problem to other ministries. So, but specifically, they take a lot of Jacob's stuff, put it on as their own uh, as their own videos, and um, and sometimes they monetize, sometimes they don't. Uh, but the the most troubling part is that they, they try to pretend that they're, they're memorial ministry and literally scam people. Like Jay was talking about, uh, giving them information about stock tips and trading and and cryptocurrency and things like that. So be careful. Be careful. Not memorial ministries will not will not do that uh, to you. So be careful with that. Thank you, Jay, for that information. Thank you, David. And uh, was there anything else? Anything? Anybody has another announcement? Um, I think that was it. Uh, um, no, I think that's it. Well, we do want to welcome everyone who's watching to remember to go to those platforms that we mentioned earlier, go to the podcast. And uh, I think those are uh, very important things to remember. Don't look, uh, don't get uh, scammed by uh, copycats that are on the website pretending to be Memorial Ministry. And, and, and apparently that's been going on. Um, I, I guess we're going to see it increasingly even more. So uh, with that said, let's catch up. Jacob, uh, real quick and... Uh, um, with just talking about hackers and scammers, uh, boy, the uh, national public data got hacked. Just as a quick, quick subject before we get into the meat of the uh, of our episode, is 2.9 billion people uh, information was stolen from major data broker. This is a hacker group. I think they're called uh, USDOD. 
and they got social security numbers. They basically have like a dossier of quite a number of people from the United States, England, and Canada. And just, um, you know, if you've seen more and more of these hacker groups hacking into energy grids, hacking into banks, hacking into da uh, public data, this was a big one. Uh, even our government has been um, hacked and the people go after um, our security uh, security uh, um, organizations. So, Jacob, any thought on this? It's, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I think it's worth mentioning, especially for people to know that your data is online and people are hacking and people are getting that information. Absolutely true. What we have to bear in mind is China, Russia, and Iran are on back of a lot of these hacking mass hacking operations they're being conducted by governments for purposes of, of of intelligence possibly getting data on people they want to blackmail will be of some use to them in their future exploits um there's a variety of cyber security services that somebody can get to protect themselves as an individual but here we're talking about penetration of of, of on a systemic level um Like the NSA, the U.S. NSA did this with the Israelis with the Stuxnet into Iran. That's We're right. talking now about something substantially bigger than that. Substantially bigger than that. Their motives may not just be fraud. Their motives may be blackmail and, of course, um, harvesting intelligence information. I don't know why they'd have to do that. All they have to do is send the gift check to Hunter Biden and he'll take care of anything they need. But <laughs> I suppose they're banking on the fact that Trump may win the election, so they're going to have to have alternate means so they can no longer trust the Biden crime family. But be that as it may, or uh, or as these things involve, evolve, I'm convinced it's, it's um, governments. And the cyber world has become a new battlefield. Yeah. And it's interesting because we have heard it from like the last 10 years, you know, an increasing amount and people having to protect themselves online because it's no longer a safe place to be. Yes. And obviously our world is interconnected now. They project it's going to be about $10.5 trillion. The cyber crime will cost the world annually. Yes. That's a lot of money. That's yes. a lot of money. And so we want to make sure that everybody is aware that this happened, and uh, it's like a whole dossier on people. And, yes. and if somebody tries to contact you and says, "Hey, you know, data leak," and we try to help you, and they send you a, a you know a link or a text message, uh, you shouldn't answer it. You shouldn't click on it because these this is how they these scammers get into. So a world has changed so dramatically, and people uh, you know get scammed all the time. So this is a big wake up call because what else are they gonna uh, hack? Jacob, I mean, you know, infrastructure data brokers, infrastructure, national defense. It's scary stuff. When you can immobilize things like traffic control systems. Oh, yeah. Red light systems of, of, of a good pattern of a major city or, or drawbridges or railway signal operations or subway systems signal operations. When you don't have to actually attack the infrastructure itself, you you will simply have to hack in to the software networks that control the infrastructure. That sh that is a game changer in itself. It's yeah. like remote warfare. You don't have to send a terrorist into the oh, target. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it from a console um, in, in another country. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's, becoming, it's, and it's becoming more and more difficult because there's usually. Three, three to eight, three to eight screens. They relay it from one place to another place to another place, and 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 it keeps changing, and yeah. they keep changing, and, and they keep changing the access codes. Oh, so it's almost impossible. Yeah, unless somebody can develop a cybersecurity system that is not for individual computers, but is that is systemic, and we're not there yet. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's only going to get worse because obviously more things go online. They want us to go into a digital world. They want us to go into an online world. And so this yeah, is what we're up against. The partial blame for this is Barack Obama. 
Gave the internet, yeah. Who gave the internet away? That was an American domain, an American product, American controlled. Even though the World Wide Web was developed in Britain, it was an American possession. Um, in fact, we can thank Barack Obama in large part for giving this to the world and making this possible. That's one of the things that will uh, uh, characterize or will define his legacy as president. Yeah, it's a gift to the world. Keeps on giving. Uh, Jacob, another gift that keeps on giving, and it's, of course, now nations cracking down, not on hackers, but on normal citizens. And here you have the UK. We talked about it last week, but now we know more about what's going on there in the crackdown on free speech. And it's absolutely at lightning speed in light of the migrant crisis and the harbinger, perhaps, of things to come to the U.S. Uh, but the globalists have been playing this game for a while. They yes. put these laws, they break, you know, under humanitarian laws, and then all of a sudden you have a problem, which is the clash of societies and civilizations that's going on in Europe, and yes. all of a sudden they weaponize the immigration crisis, and now yes. any citizen that's, that is anti-establishment, so if you criticize the government and the establishment, if you yes. criticize their policies, it's not only that you could be banned from social media, you will face jail time. Jacob, uh, can you comment on this? Because it's going on right by where you live. Great Britain is setting the precedent. They know that once it's established in Great Britain, it'll eventually be adopted by other countries, most likely, particularly Commonwealth countries. But the ultimate goal is, of course, the United States. Um, I just watched some people complaining, saying that uh, Elon Musk in the Trump interview should have been censored, should have been censored. And it was a, it was a left-wing journalist saying oh. this. The Manchester Guardian or formerly Manchester, but it's called The Guardian now, newspaper in England. Again, left-wing journalists are, are, are saying this. So you've got journalists, which should be at the forefront of free speech, now at the forefront of, of politically controlled censorship of speech they don't like. Um, again, KGB, Pravda, call it what you will. The disappearing of democracy and the, and the pace at which it is disappearing, the time is short. Now, ultimately, we know Satan's aim is to stop the preaching of the gospel and the, and the proclaiming of the return of Christ. We need to redeem the time and present the gospel while we still have time. They will stop this. Um, the only light at the end of the tunnel is Jesus is coming. Now, we know that these people, almost all of them are going to go to hell. They're all go they'll go to hell. Um, if you speak out against... Um, Gender reassignment surgery for underage children, that's a hate crime. You, you know, going after you. Um, well, those people will go to hell. And, uh, and that's the way it's going to be. Arresting Christians are preaching the gospel online. That'll be next. They'll go after gospel presentations online. They're already arresting street preachers. Now they'll do it with, with people using the internet to, to evangelize. That will be next. Jesus said this would come. But what they're not looking at is the fact that he is coming. He is coming. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. The faster he gets here, the better it's going to be. But things are going to get worse before they get better. Yeah, they, they, have, have, to, uh, yeah, they have this 61-year-old man who, 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 now he wasn't online. This is the interesting thing. It's online, but it's also in person. He was protesting and telling police officers that they're not doing their job they're not even uh, they're not even English anymore because they're doing the job of globalists. And and he says, well, who you know? He used an expletive about Allah, and he was given jail time for yes, eight right. months. Yeah, eighteen months. A forty year old man who basically was protesting online on his own Twitter page the fact that you know migrants get to do this to our children. Migrants get to you know they they rape our women and all this stuff. That's what he was saying, and he's now facing twenty months because of his yep. post. So tweets, Facebook posts, uh, it kind of reminds me of the old Soviet Union or Venezuela or yeah, Cuba. Well, or, you know, in my anger, I would say that the judges, the prosecutors, and the police, senior police bureaucrats, so, and the politicians responsible for this should not be getting 20 months. They should be getting 20 years. No, God has with something much better in store. Eternity in the lake of fire. That's what's coming for them. David Lister, there's about more than 3,300, uh, some, some estimate maybe 4,000, of 
British citizens who have been arrested, have been visited by police and arrested because of their tweets over the past few years and Facebook posts, online speech uh, in Russia, which they all claim to be this kind of crazy totalitarian state. There's only been about 400 in the same period of the time. So, so almost 4,000, 400. And yet this is happening in uh, not in Cuba, not in Nicaragua, where my family's from, not in East Germany, not in the old Soviet Union. Uh, this is uh, the United Kingdom. This is England, uh, which Scotland and, and, and uh, it's it's not too far behind with some of the uh, online speech acts. But what do, you, what do you think about this, David? Well, this is the warning shots. Let's just throw a few thousand in jail as examples. And how many sheep do you think will stay in the pit, as it were? Mm. You know, and and that's the thing is that the, this is these are the examples. Let's just hit them hard here, and then when uh, it comes to America, when it comes to Germany, when it comes to other places, people will fall in line, yeah. and and that's all you have to do. You know, so they're the big example. They're the forerunner, the ones that get the privilege. Of, uh, I mean, of, yeah. Styling totalitarianism in a in what was once a democratic government. Yeah, so, so you have anti-establishment rhetoric. You can't say anything against the government. Anti-immigration policies can't say anything against uh, immigration policies. You can't say anything in regards to you know what they're doing and the in the police system that they have there. Uh, plus, at the same time, uh, this is how it's becoming. And, and I'll give you one example. So. This is within our lifetime, maybe about 10 years ago. If um, if you had a friend, you know, let's say John, and John wanted to be a woman, and and John was called you know Gina now, and but you called him John by accident or something like that, you could get banned by Twitter. Twitter would actually ban you. Back and then, um, yeah. yeah, and okay, no harm, no foul. It's just an account. Maybe you get another one or things like that. Now it became then it became a uh, an actual hate speech. So they said this is hate. This is you're actually hating. It's not just you know, um, you know, a confusion or it's not just rude. It's a hate speech. Uh, Jacob, where is this going to go now? Is misgendering going to lead you to uh, prison because on online you call somebody by a different name or I'm uh, sorry, misgender them or they call them dead names. So like a like your old man's, you know, if you were a man, then your name before you became a woman, that's a dead name or misgendering. It, it's not where this is going because it's moving very quickly. Yeah, like, like Jenner in the United States, they want to criminalize it. That's exactly correct. They are forcing you to agree with something that is scientifically untrue. Um, <laughs> just look what happened in the Olympics. Yeah, you get no medals in women's sports. And yeah. if you don't accept it, you're a criminal. Yeah. They arrested, they arrested Christian protesters peacefully protesting in Paris. Yeah. They were taken to jail and, and mistreated by the by the gendarme, by the police. By the police, yeah. You know, Jacob, the uh, the other thing that came out of this was now the schools in the United Kingdom are going to be teaching children based on this events that have happened over the past yes. few weeks. Uh, regarding misinformation and extremist content. So children are able to know what misinformation is or extremist content. I have parents. And know what to do about it because they can just really Turn, turn people in. This is this is the, going to be the new school systems where you are training kids how to become spies for the government. Not only that, spy on parents and okay. in the social services. There are a lot of lesbians and homosexuals who are the child welfare officers. There's a lot of homosexuals and lesbians in those positions coming after your children by power of law. That is how evil and demonic it is. Right. Also, we got to remember that they've already started arresting people for praying in their mind. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This what is, are you this... doing? I'm praying. Are you praying about abortion? Well, I know enough to keep my mouth shut. I just say I'm praying. And actually, fortunately, Britain, under the Magna Carta and other laws, you're allowed to be silent. You don't have to answer their question. Yeah, so this is this is the MP. That Again, they would never arrest a Muslim for, for, the, for kneeling down in the street and praying towards Mecca. Never. That's right. Yeah. So the MP voted the for legislation. Yeah. yeah, they voted for legislation last year that would uh, basically ban uh, public prayer 
115 meters around an abortion clinic. And this came about because of uh, the, the Christian lady, Isabel, a brave yeah. Christian lady who went and prayed outside the abortion clinic. She was arrested twice. Uh, and now this law is coming back into play because it's uh, abortion clinic, hospitals that provide abortion. So silent prayer, as David was talking about, is going to become outlawed within a certain amount of meters from that place, even if you're just praying in your mind. It's not even preaching. It's, it's, so let alone preaching, Jacob, let alone standing outside, uh, you know, preaching. And so this is uh, this is the New England. This is a new UK government who Steimer has come out and said, don't share Anything about what's going on. Don't put it on Facebook. Don't put it on Twitter. Don't share videos. If you do, you're going to meet the law. You're going to meet, and they're going to fully prosecute to the fully extent of the law if you put images of migrants, uh, uh, Islamic migrants attacking British citizens. Yeah, you'll get arrested for that. Um, but they had a, a Muslim in, in the Midlands recently raped a 12 year old girl. And uh, he got no custodial sentence, none. Yeah. If you speak critically about Islamic immigration, you'll go to jail. What do you do with this? These judges, no, it's not just the Islamofascists. It is the judges and the prosecutors, the police bureaucrats, and the politicians. They will come under the judgment of God. Yeah. Jacob, any thought about turning this tide back? Any, anything that... Not only, obviously, prayer, obviously, the church is standing faithful to pray and to seek the Lord, but anything that you could see in the horizon that can turn this tide back? In Great Britain, certainly not. The church in Britain is a joke. The, the, the state church, the Church of England, is a complete and utter joke. It is a worthless piece of garbage from top to bottom. Anybody who's born again and stays in it should be ashamed of themselves. You've got an archbishop an Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, who, putting a benediction, proclaiming a benediction on same-sex marriages, as long as you don't call it a marriage, as long as you call it a standing alone. Standing alone? Yeah. You go to the civil registry office and have a civil wedding, and then come to a vicar in a church, he can bless it, as long as he calls it a standing alone and not a wedding. They just play games with semantics and change the words. And Welby has proclaimed this. Um, wow. Wow. And when it came up in the Synod, he would not vote against it. Neither would he vote for it. He said he has to preserve unity so he can down on the fence. This is Welby. This is the Church of England. England is too much of a joke. Its church is too much of a joke. The body of Christ in England was destroyed by counterfeit revivals. Satan had powerful agents in control of denominations and movements. Uh, they imported the many preachers from the United States, like Morris Sorello, the con artist. They imported all kinds of things. They imported Mike Bickle and the Kansas City False Prophets. Now we find out that these guys, like Gerald Coates, who, who <laughs> did these things, he himself, something we've all known but couldn't prove, was a, was a homosexual who was approaching underage boys. He was the, the big figure of the restoration movement in the UK. And he's only one example. We see this, the same kind of scandals you've had with Hillsong and with, with Ke the Kansas City uh, IHOP and so forth. Well, England is even worse. England mm. is even worse. There is no prospect of revival coming to England unless it happens outside the mainstream churches and denominations. There would have to be a move of God like the Jesus movement with the hippies, something outside the mainstream churches and denominations. If anybody thinks the Evangelical Alliance or the Church of England is worth anything more than a bucket of spit, they're living in a fantasy world. They're delusional. David, uh, are we seeing the same thing coming in America when you have Anthony Blinken and Merrick Garland literally saying that they're going to go after misinformation, malinformation, and disinformation. They're literally just making up words as we speak and saying that they will come out against people that promote this stuff. Aren't we already on the cusp of that? What Jacob was saying, it's going to be the first test is going to be England, but then it's going to move toward other English speaking countries. Aren't we in 1984 already? <laughs> I read that book. It's really interesting. You know, I I did read that as like a kid, and and I never expected that 
I will probably be living in it. Mm. But I mean, just the way he was so right in so many ways, you know, that that the ability to have thought crimes, the ability to change words and give them new meanings, you know. Yeah. Change double, double, double meaning. Also, lifetime revisionism. Yeah. You know, what the party line was last week, they can say that was never our line. Well, yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Look at the Harris Walsh campaign. You know, <laughs> she's trying to distance herself from Bidenomics and from the border policies as if she had nothing to do with it. You know, we we have to be unburdened by the past. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a lifetime continual updating revisionism. And this revisionism. is what you saw in 1984, and this is what's happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, like and, the past is last week, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, when you have Google as the mini true that can just send something into a memory hole and completely yeah. erase it and make it unfindable, then you basically live in a state that controls everything you see, hear, and think. Yeah, it's already there. And with AI, that is going to be at hyperspeed now because hi, hi, uh, AI can give you a, a different reality, a, a, a false sense of reality. You just look at what happened with Trump, the assassination of Trump. You almost can't even fight it. It's almost like it didn't happen. You ask the average person, did this happen? I think I was watching a video. I think it was Alexa by Amazon. Did Trump get shot? Alexa responds, he did not get shot. There were just two assassination attempts, but they capture the and they capture the shooter. It, it, it didn't happen that way. And you almost like, you know, kids hear this stuff or young people hear this stuff and they go, oh, okay, what are you talking about? He didn't even get assassinated. He, nothing happened to him. And it is this absolutely insanity world that we live in today. AI has changed, really, perception. Internet has changed the perception. And then, of course, the Republicans who could do something about it here in this country say, hey, let's take back this stuff. Won't, won't do anything. They'll talk about it, but they won't have any real progress toward limiting uh, big tech or censorship or anything like that. Uh, Jacob, what do you think? Am I, am I uh, right on that assessment? They won't do anything. No, they won't do anything. They will not do anything. The Second Amendment is under attack. The First Amendment is under attack. The Fourth Amendment is under attack. You just look what they're doing. Oh, we got a freeze here. Um, you just look what they're doing with Tulsi Gabbard. She is on a terrorist watch list, and every time she gets on an airplane, she's profiled taken out of the line, out of the queue, and interrogated for up to 45 minutes. This is a lieutenant colonel in the military reserves and a former woman. Yeah. And just for political reasons, she's on a terrorist watch list by a corrupt, evil government that stupid people will still vote for. It's, and, you know, all this prophetically is setting the table for the one to come that will have a number and that number can probably be given to everybody so that the controlling and the buying and selling will all be under his number you know and, yeah. and you will either comply or you will be destroyed one way or another and I think with the acceleration of digital IDs, the push for them too, it's going to get worse. The censorship is going to get worse very quickly to, um, yeah, they're going to demand for you to have identity online. They're going to, you know, in order for you to get online, you're going to have to have an ID in order to to be able to even get online. That's yes, awesome. And then, you'll, and then you'll only be able to post uh, the narrative, you know, the the acceptable party line sort of. Yeah. Yeah. You mean we're going to have to be approved? You have to be a proved member of the government. Uh, and Jacob, I want to ask you this. Why isn't China, Russia, India, Saudi Arabia, you know, most of the BRICS nations, never come under any pressure from any UN or WEF to allow this massive immigration into their countries? Why is it that those get an exception, but everything in the West, everything here in the English-speaking world, you have to swallow the immigration policies that they have. It's only the West seems to be pressurized to have this problem. Basically, you're importing more and more problems by having way too much, um, you know, way too much immigration crisis, way too much problems in crime and violence. Why don't those other countries get that? Two reasons. One is the WEF agenda, globalist agenda. 
Two, who wants to immigrate to India? Who wants to, Im most of India is impoverished. Who wants to immigrate to China? It is a dictatorship. Who wants to immigrate to Russia? Who live under Putin? It, it was, who wants to move to, nobody does. Nobody wants to go to those places. Easy for them. Yeah, there's no policies at all whatsoever to say you must accept whether it is Palestinian crisis with Saudi Arabia, whether it is people in Russia that need, want to move there. Uh, like you said, maybe they don't want to move there. Uh, but there's no pressure at all to the government to accept this or else. None. It's only it's in like, Europe, but in America, Australia, only in the West. Yeah, it's and some like of those, uh, Australia, New Zealand, are going quick. Davey, yeah. I just saw that thing where if the UN comes to uh, your house, you ain't. Don't comply. They can make you comply. Is that? Did you have a notice about that? Uh, that's definitely true in Western Australia. I, that's been on the books in Western Australia for years. Wow. Um, I haven't actually. I'm not up to date with our own state's rules, and that, that's definitely true in New Zealand too. Wow. Put you on the table and give you a jab. Yep. If you yeah, resist. That, if yeah. you resist. Yeah, if you resist, for sure. Uh, let, let's switch over to what's going on with the Ukraine and Russia uh, war. Uh, one particular subject that was interesting is the former head of the German intelligence. Uh, I think his name is Hughes, uh, August Hanning, sorry, August Hanning, came out on, on German television and basically said, no, it wasn't the Russians who blew up the pipeline. It was actually a collaboration between the Ukraine government and the Polish government. They mentioned Zelensky as well as the Polish uh, the Polish uh, uh, president uh, Duda, Andrzej Duda. So it, it, it's interesting. Germany began to search this, and, and NATO came out and said, "Yeah, we don't really think it was the Russians. The the Germans want to arrest an actual scuba diver, a scuba diver. His name is actually Vladimir uh, Vladimir Z. Vladimir Z." Not Zelensky, probably another guy, after identifying him that he was, you know, near the pipelines with explosives that day. Uh, Polish authorities haven't claimed anything yet, but uh, Germany is issuing Germany is issuing an arrest, a warrant for an arrest of this man. And they are pretty sure, based on intelligence information, it was not the Russians. Jacob, we talked about that when that happened. And uh, the mainstream narrative was Russia, Russia, Russia. Now we know it's um, it was probably not them. Yeah, remember when they hot Mike Kissinger with the bogus phone call and yeah. he was talking to a Ukrainian? <laughs> well, before Kissinger died, he said that he said the Ukrainians. Yeah. So this is not new. It's just he's another person coming out and saying it. Kissinger was the first one to disclose it. Yeah, it's so, it's amazing now that it was, the, known in, it was known in diplomatic communities and obviously in the intelligence community, it was known who did it. Yeah, but now it's on the mainstream. Now it's on the mainstream. Now it's on news that it's like, uh oh, I'm, I'm sure they're not going to get you know they're not going to get an apology for it or anything like that. But oh, it, Poland will maintain Poland and the Ukraine will maintain plausible deniability. Yeah. And uh, you remember Seymour Hirsch is the one that came out with their article. The article said, you know, he was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, said that the pipelines were destroyed by the U.S., he says. It was a CIA operatives, uh, a part of a covert operation. So that's another interesting uh, angle on that. I thought it was the Americans and British who did it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, interesting. That's go back to 2022. But regarding the war, Jacob, this is... Uh, it's been a really rapid movement of Ukrainian forces into the area of Kursk, into the area of, uh, of Kursk, and they have tactical vehicles. They've had, they conquered 82 settlements, about 1,100, uh, 1150 square kilometers, and they have advanced about 35 kilometers into Kursk, and this is the Ukrainian um, Ukrainian army. So your thoughts on that, Jacob? The, the, the Russians seems to be giving up on that area. It's upwards of a thousand square kilometers, not a huge amount of turf, but nothing to ignore either. Absurdly, Putin has called it a terrorist attack. No, a, a loss of a thousand square kilometers now occupied by the Ukrainians is not a terrorist attack. The real damage that's being incurred is not purely strategic. 
the Ukrainians are obviously, as most military experts saying, trying to draw Russian troops away from the eastern Ukraine to have to defend Russia itself. Okay. So they're trying to alleviate pressure on the eastern Ukraine so that they can counterattack and liberate their own Ukrainian territories. That's the first the first reason. Second reason, it is a uh uh potential bargaining chip in future negotiations with Russia mm -hmm. on Russian withdrawal from from Iranian turfs. But the third is the big big one. I I, I don't think we can appreciate it. But the, again, this is the first time since the Second World War that Russia has been invaded yeah. by a foreign army. Now, Kursk is, in, is the area where the biggest tank battle of the Second World War took place between the Soviet Red Army and the Germans and the Wehrmacht. That was the it was German panzers. It was the biggest tank battle of the Second World War took place exactly where this, this is happening. That is interesting in itself, the historical significance of, 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 of where, where the incursion has taken place. But for Russia to have been invaded, even a thousand square kilometers, and it's going to get bigger than that. Not right, much bigger, exactly. But it's going to get bigger. This is not only a national affront, but it certainly demonstrates the weakening position of Putin. Is He has to be becoming politically weakened and, and increasingly desperate. This war, they thought, was going to be over at the most in a few weeks, if not a few days. Here we are over two years later, and there are Ukrainian troops now inside Russia. The Kremlin has actually been hit by gliders or by drones. drones. Oil refineries have been repeatedly attacked, affecting Russian oil production. Um, multiple other military targets, including two air bases, just within the past week, uh, have been hit. Inside, all inside Russia. But now you've got foreign troops, boots on the ground, occupying Russian territory. They are building a defense perimeter, um, showing that they know that they cannot easily stop the Ukrainians where the Ukrainians are. The Russians are, are planning to even give up more turf yeah. in order to put up a viable defense. Let's remember, from the Ukrainian border to Moscow is only 300 miles. Only 300 miles. Now, I'm not saying that Zelensky or the Ukrainians are going to make a march on Moscow the way that that uh, Wagner Group guy did. I'm not saying they're in a position to do that. But psychologically, Putin comes from a generation that lived in the shadow of what they called the Great Patriotic War, that the Germans reached the outskirts, reached Moscow, Moscow's outskirts. Some German units could actually see the Kremlin. Stalin nearly had to abandon Moscow. He was at a railway station ready to flee if he had to. That was the great fear, and that was the justification that they used for the Warsaw Pact to put Russian troops in Poland and Hungary and the Czech Republic and so forth. We've got to keep building wall upon wall again. So this never happens to the motherland again. Well, it's happened to the motherland again. Yes. The psychological impact of this on Putin, on the children of the older generation who remember the Second World War, the psychological impact is devastating. And it can only underscore the political weakness of Putin himself. The thing is, there are restrictions on the high Mars and on other advanced American weapons, probably on German weapons too. The tanks that have entered into um, Russia are British Chieftain Twos, Chieftain Two tanks, which are good tanks, which are good tanks. But the Leopards, the German Leopards and the American M1s have, have not been green-lighted to act, enter into Russian territory. Uh, it'll also be interesting to see what happens when the F-16s become fully operational. The Ukrainian pilots 
are going to need a while to get good at flying the F-16s, but it's it, it's it's it it is definitely somewhat of a game changer. Um, it, it is a different kind of warfare. One of the things we are seeing here is, I would compare it to the American Civil War in a sense. The last conventional war using Napoleonic tactics was the Crimean War, when the right. British fought Russia in Crimea. That was the last war. The American Civil War was the game changer because you had people who went to West Point or via my Virginia Military Academy who were taught the Napoleonic tactics and strategy, okay, for a pre-industrial war. Now you had railroads that could move thousands of troops and tons and tons of munitions and ordnance and weapons very quickly. You had telegraph communications, not just couriers on horseback. You had um, industrial production, uh, and steel, uh, ironworks, things of this nature. Uh, so they tried to fight a uh, industrial war with <clears throat> old Napoleonic tactics. The American Civil War was the first war we had electric mines to blow up ships. It was the first war we had submarine warfare. The trench warfare that defined World War I in its early years began in the siege of Richmond and Petersburg in Virginia. Trench warfare began in the American Civil War. Well, what you see happening now in the Ukraine is like that again. This is a high-tech war, a high-tech war. Um, with, with these drones, with these other kinds of projectiles, and obviously there's a certain amount of cyber warfare involved. Um, it is a new kind of war. How do you fight a new kind of war with new kinds of weapon systems using the old tactics? Uh, it's, an ex it's, it's an experiment. And people in the Pentagon and in NATO are watching it very closely because I believe that they don't really know. They don't really know how a country like Ukraine could have stood up to Russia this long, something that, according to the old rules of conventional warfare, should have been over in, a, in two weeks. Now right. it's gone on more than two years. What is this going to mean for the future? Yeah, it, it's going to be for sure. I was I was watching a uh, a video by the old CEO of Google, uh, Schmidt, Eric Schmidt, and he was talking about how he and other Stanford professors were developing AI like warfare machines. Uh, and he was he called himself like an AI arm dealers, you know, and he was getting this this technology and he was getting it into the into the battlefield. So it, it is a totally different warfare now and AI controlling robotics and AI controlling drones and AI it's it's crazy how fast it's developed to the yes. point where now yes. You have people that are arm dealers, but they're like, um, you know, Google engineers or Stanford engineers uh, using AI in the battlefield. AI combined with robotics and drones. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's nasty. It's a really nasty war. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, David this. The families in Russia were outraged because they're saying the Russian troops were outmanned, outgunned, no training, no weapons. They were abandoned there. And it's led to the largest capture of uh, Russian soldiers since the war began. And this is, of course, in light of the Warsaw uh, battle that happened in uh, in 1920. It was this week, and uh, in which the Polish uh, Polish troops were able to beat back the Soviet Union. So, David, what do you think? I mean, it's just it's an embarrassment after embarrassment. There's no training. There's no tactical maneuvering by Russian soldiers. What are we to make of this? Is Russia going to? Is it very vulnerable? What do we think? Well, it's starting to show you that their uh, their prime soldiers that are trained and career soldiers, uh, they're being worn down. They don't have them, or they're being kept in reserve or back behind the lines. But uh, they've run, they're running out of they're running out of good soldiers. They're just throwing bodies. Almost mm -hmm. like when Hitler was throwing in his Hitler youth and and handing people broomsticks, you know, to fight the oncoming Soviets. Right. You know, so 
it's it's a feature of war that this happens. I mean, like when Japan was almost defeated, they were handing out, you know, brooms and all sorts of stuff, a sickle, a shovel. You would fight with anything. And this is what it's come for. for uh, does, does this make Russia very dangerous with the, this kind of a situation that's going on? Now they're backed against the wall, so to speak. And I, uh, desperate with nuclear, uh, maybe a tactical nuclear. I was wanting, I was going to ask Jacob, I said, is he unstable enough and desperate enough, you know, to actually decide to use uh, uh, nuclear weapons? You know, when I was in, when we were in San Antonio, I, I got to pray with a corporal that, I mean, not a corporal, but a colonel. Uh, that was going to Germany. He said he's facilitating the transfer of of weapons and supplies to Ukraine. You know, so so it's still ongoing, man. One of the things we've been saying from the beginning, Marco, if you recall, is desperate people do desperate things, and this incursion into Russian turf itself, Ukraine, this national humiliation, and this humiliation of Putin. Ex exposing his vulnerability as a, as a leader, um, this increases the degree of desperation. Really? You know, it's speaking of the, uh, the the nuclear capabilities and nuclear problems, there's there's this prospect of a nuclear accident uh, yes. that seems to be waiting to happen in the Saporizhia power plant in Ukraine, and this is of course being taken over by the Russians, and they they they've been mishandling it. Even the uh, international. Uh, the, the UN's top nuclear watchdog was going in there and they said, this is grossly, um, grossly mishandled. There's no way of, you know, reverting back some of the stuff that they've done. It's reckless. And they could see a Chernobyl type situation yeah. happening. And my thought is, do you think these Russians would just let it happen just because it's a I Ukraine? Think would, I think it's not, not over speculative to say that not that they would let it happen, but they would cause it to happen and blame it on the Ukrainians. <laughs> you go. Yeah, it, it's it's many local people are very concerned that it, because they, they shut it down and then they don't cool it down. And there's uh, I, th I think there's like three, three uh, or maybe four. I think it's uh, reactors that they have there. And so they don't cool them down. It's running hot. It smokes. Yes. And people are absolutely frightened. The U.N. is absolutely frightened that this could happen uh, in, in a Ukrainian territory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, that's that's the, one of the fears that I have. But Jacob, I want to switch this. As we're talking about war, uh, obviously the Israeli war, the war against Israel. And this is, of course, how many days? I forgot to even mention at the beginning, 325 days now since yeah. the attack, wow. since October 7th. And uh, the hostages are still there. And of course, there's no resolution at all whatsoever at this point. But the Palestinian leader, Abbas, which he's, I don't know, he came out of some hole. I don't know where he's been. He comes out and he's invited by another dictator, uh, Erdogan, and he goes to Ankara to speak about Gaza, Jerusalem, going there with the con uh, Confederation of Arab Nations, Muslim Nations. Uh, uh, Jacob, what do you think? Summarize it for us. What was Abbas doing there, desperate uh, to get power again? Okay, first of all, remember Abbas, which, who was Fatah, there was a Yasser Arafat's party that controlled the Palestinian Authority. They were forced out of Gaza by Hamas. Now that Hamas is being systematically dismantled by the Israelis and its senior leadership is being killed, Abbas is seeing an opportunity to bring it back under the control of Fatah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because the Israelis are, are getting rid of uh, Hamas systematically. Sinwar is the only really major leader left. They, they, they've killed the other ones. Um, that he sees it as an opportunity to get back in. He'll want to involve other Muslim nations, other Muslim governments, and say, look, give us control of Gaza, and we will agree to a ceasefire and a peace treaty like we have at the West Bank. Oh, and man. A stepping stone to, to a Palestinian state. That is the game he's playing. The casualty figures... Um, being put out by Hamas of 40,000 killed. Well, we know they're lying. However, CNN is reporting it as factual. Um, oh, now, CNN, of course, 
CNN are, are broke, are ridiculous. It, CNN is now a money losing operation. They've lost two hundred million dollars this year so far. Um, they can't cover their costs anymore, um, and they're declining. That's CNN. But um, they, they, they are accepting the Hamas figures of forty thousand killed. Well, even if those figures were true, which they're not, remember, most of those civilians would have been killed because their own government, the Hamas government, is using them as human shields. They were getting their own people killed, using them as human shields, because they know the BBC and the CNN would come and say, look what oh, the Israelis did. They will do it. And they've been. And they've yeah, been. Yeah. But, but Erdogan, Erdogan, again, he has, a, he's, he has two ambitions. One, his own economy is disintegrating under his feet. So he has to divert people's away, uh, attention away in Turkey from what, from the havoc that he and his policies have wrecked on the Turkish economy. That's first of all. Secondly, he sees himself as a reincarnation of Suleiman the Great or something. I mean, <laughs> figuratively, figuratively speaking. He wants to resurrect the Ottoman Empire and extend its tentacles and influence throughout the Islamic world, and that must be the, the Muslim Arab world. And so that is his game. But Abbas' game is clear. The Israelis are getting rid of Hamas. What's going to happen to Gaza? I want it back. That is what it basically comes to. And we can be sure that the Biden administration will give it to him. I, if they were still in office uh, or, you know, a Harris administration would give it to him. Um, who, but who else is he going to give it to? So that's his game. That is his absolute game. What I would also add is it was announced today that the negotiations uh, in Doha, in the Gulf, broke down. Um yeah, I was going to ask you about that because Qatar has been urging the ceasefire, urging Iran not yeah. to get involved and and let it happen. And they they actually said in the, during the week that it showed promise that this 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 ceasefire showed promise only uh, to have to walk out. Today yeah, so broke down. today it's broke down. What you basically see happening is Sinwar has become the senior leader of Hamas now, That's and right. Israelis want to kill him, obviously. The reason this war has gone on is because of the hostages. You know, the Israelis can go in there and do what they need to do and end this war very quickly. But what about the hostages? And right. what about civilian casualties? They use their own children as, as human shields. That is why the war has taken, is going on so long <clears throat> with these tunnel complexes and so forth. Um, <clears throat> you can destroy everything on the surface, but what is underground is where the war is being mainly fought from. Um, that's why it has been protracted. And uh, Hamas is not in the market for a real negotiated end. They don't want to give the hostages go. That's their only bargaining chip to try to save Sinwar's neck and other things. But they do want a ceasefire. <clears throat> They had one actor holding up dolls, dolls, crying in the rubble. The Israelis killed my baby. Stop oh, killing man. Palestinians. And it was a doll. I mean, that's not the first time they've done this. <laughs> it's all a propaganda game. But that's what's actually happening. Yeah, that, there's no doubt that Qatar <laughs> wants to broker the deal. Ankara wants to broker the deal. Uh, blinking is going to actually be there on Sunday. Uh, Jacob in Israel, uh, speaking to Netanyahu about, you know, possibly next week, a ceasefire. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, I don't think they're going to be able to do anything about this. I mean, why isn't the U.S. a major broker in this? Why do they have to go to Qatar? Qatar is the only state that is friendly with both Iran and the West. Qatar is... Total opportunists, total opportunism. For sure, for sure. And unless you deal with Iran, you're not going to get a ceasefire because Iran pulls the, spr the strings concerning what both Hamas and Hezbollah do. So you can't negotiate directly with Iran, 
but you can do it by proxy through Qatar. Yeah. Iran and Qatar share this humongous, humongous natural gas field underneath the Gulf. So there's an economic in- incentive and reason for their cooperation diplomatically. Yeah. <laughs> well, Qatar has a very dark money there, very a lot of blood money. It is one of the... Well, Al Jazeera is... I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Unbelievable stuff, man. But I, I wanted to ask you this, Jacob. We, we read an article, the Biden-Harris appeasement, <laughs> the Biden-Harris appeasement of uh, Iran and the retaliation against yes. Israel that was possibly coming. And they, they've been saying it's going to happen, but they haven't happened yet. Uh, the the fact that the Biden administration told Iran that they did not know that Israel was going to assassinate the uh, Hamas leaders and some of the other leaders, the Iranian leaders that were there from uh, from their army, and basically blaming it. Yeah, since we were in the dark, we were in the dark. Nothing happened. That you know, we didn't know. Our agencies didn't know. Uh, what a bunch of liars to go there and try to kiss the boots of the Iranians again. Well, that that's uh, that was Obama and Valerie Jarrett. And and um, Susan Rice, they were the first ones to kneel down and lick the and, and John Kerry with Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, Susan Rice, Valerie Jarrett, and Barack Obama, and of course Joe Biden. They were the initial team of bootlickers. Well, now this is just the uh, relief team. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget this entire catastrophe was funded courtesy of the Joe Obama policies of removing the oil sanctions on Iran. They economically would have been incapable of funding what Hezbollah is doing, what the Houthis are doing, or what Hamas is doing. The blame for this is at the feet of Obama, Biden, Harris, and co. You know, Marco, just this past few days was the third anniversary of the Taliban celebrate well celebrating the defeat of America. They yep. actually celebrated that. Yeah, they, they put on our brilliant. billions of dollars worth of uh, equipment on parade, helicopters, tanks, jeeps, troops, fully armed. There and and on top of all this insult that they're doing, we're still sending them thirty million dollars a month. Yep, this is Harris, and, and there are, there are people of, of of low enough intelligence to think it's all right and still vote for Harris. No, no absolutely, yeah. The, they're the, the largest I, armed. T- t- the army in uh, in that region <laughs> made in the USA. And made by the, the way, I just like to mention real quick that thirty million dollars includes payment to families in which their son died killing American soldiers. Yes. Yeah, we That's subsidize so. taking care of families that had a, a a family member that killed an American, and we continue to subsidize that. That's your yeah. taxpayer money at work under Biden Harris. Yes. Yep. When the administration went to Iran, David Lister, the delegation presented a list of Mossad agents, 10 of them that are working with Iran. So basically selling out any kind of intelligence within Iran that Israel could gather uh, because Iran has been very, uh, you know, obviously threatening and using and maybe thinking of using tactical, some kind of tactical weapon. If they have it already, we we don't know. But you give them the, for what? What was the trade-off? Well, Saudi Arabia and Iran are not the best of friends. In fact, the one is a Shiite and the others are Sunnis and Saudi and longtime enemies. So um, they could be trying to buy some favor to make sure that Iran's attention is focused on on Israel and not on them. Saudis have always tried to manipulate and make sure that the, the royals can keep their heads on their shoulders. 
That's one of the first duties. Yeah, it's very bizarre that the U.S. would actually do that, but except except for that they always betray Israel. Yeah, yeah that's really at the heart of the matter. Yeah, right? yeah. But Biden and Harris always betray Israel. Always. But let's also remember the Saudi Arabians have unloaded a tremendous amount of T bills. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting it everywhere. Manipulating, manipulating it for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the economy for a little bit because uh, in dealing with Kamala Harris, and um, I don't know if you guys watched that little exchange with the Republican uh, congresswoman that was in, on CNN and she kept calling her Kamala. And then everybody's like, no, that's not her name. You're a racist. And so I guess you can't call her that anymore because that's not her real name. And, and you know, you would be a racist if you call her Kamala. So anyway. What whatever. race would we be? They'd be insulting. Uh, I don't know. Uh, black people, I guess. But she's not even black. Yeah. With that. I mean, you know, we're friends with Indians, so we just Irish Hindu. She's actually and, and most actually, Americans can't pronounce those long names anyway. I, you know, she's Irish and Hindu. She's actually related to Jacob, yeah. not to Jacob. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, Kamala and the Dems, DNC in Chicago Monday night. Her talking points are literally just copy and paste from the Trump uh, uh, plan. No taxes on tips and first time home buyers and, and and all kinds of just bizarre stuff. And she actually admitted that it's prices have gone up. I have a chart here. Everything's gone up. Gasoline, electricity, airfare, groceries, rent. Um, what is this? American under Kamala. Yeah, prices have gone up. Average of 20%. Eggs, 47%. Car insurance, 54%. Uh, education, 66%. So it's it just unbelievable. Everything's gone up. Pretends nothing happens. Now she wants price controls. Jacob, uh, comment on that. Well, first of all, remember, as vice president presiding over the Senate, she cast a deciding vote on what is called the Inflation Reduction Act, was the Inflation Induction Act, plus another legislation. So she personally is responsible for what's happening. It's not just vote responsibility as vice president. It was her vote as president of the Senate, in her capacity as vice president, that caused this. One of the consequences is that houses now cost double what they did before she got into power. Young couples cannot get a down payment on a house. They cannot get a mortgage to acquire a property for a young family or some newlyweds. It's almost impossible for most of them, almost. Today, her proposal is for first-time buyers to give them $25,000. In other words, where are they going to get the money? Print it. Quantitative easing. Print it, drive the inflation up even further to give $25,000 to these people to buy a house that the price of which is only doubled because of the quantitative easing and printing the money that she approved of. No. Um Double. This is how, and she'll get away with it. ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, MSNBC won't say anything. And the people who vote for her are, are, are of such low intelligence, generally. They're, they're, they're so stupid that they don't understand it or know it. Yeah. Marco, I you know, like, like, stupid people, like these women who watch The View. They're just they're very stupid people. People of, you know, almost a sudden human level of intelligence. They don't have any idea. Some of the things, Marco, that's going on with the economy is these numbers they keep bringing out. Okay, uh, they said, oh, the uh, producer price index is up 1%. Okay, so that means we're growing. Well, if you look at it, it's 1% of the dollar value, not of the amount of merchandise. In other words... You inflate a product that costs more, you're selling a lot less, but it, they're making it look like, oh, we're having an increasing economy. But it's showing that people, consumers, are backing off of buying goods and services. People have run out of savings. And so they're having to now make, on the lower end of the spectrum, buy food or gas has gotten so bad. And the other numbers that, that Wall Street is just, it's crazy. They look at one number 
and then they celebrate it. It drives uh, the stock market up. But the you know we get uh, some of the profits they've made. Okay, they've driven them up. But goods and services are going up because of the high cost of energy and the new uh, and the new taxes. And now Kamali wants to come in and raise taxes on corporations. People don't understand. Corporations pay taxes, of course, but they sell products to pay for those taxes and consumers buy those. So they have to raise any taxes raised on corporations and things like this. It's having to be passed on to the consumer. And I don't think anybody took economics 101 anymore. I don't think anybody even understands. Uh, You can't expect somebody who'd clap. At the garbage coming out of the mouth of a Whoopi Goldberg or a Joy Behar, somebody would clap when they when they spew out their ignorant garbage. You can't expect somebody like that to be able to think rationally. Yeah, they're just so ignorant. Now the price controls. Any either either of you can answer the price control. This has been tried before. This has been tried in Soviet Union and Nicaragua, in, in Russia, uh, never worked. Never, never, ever, ever has worked in any other country. In fact, what it does, it creates a shortage because you can't sell the product anymore for a profit or what companies need to. But so it is a disaster waiting to happen. It's going to look like Venezuela pretty soon. Nixon did it. Nixon did his wage price freeze and it didn't stop the inflation. Because it doesn't work. Yeah, that's it right. Work. As, yeah. as I, I think I said last week. It's like putting the lid on the pressure cooker and turning up the heat, the gas at the same time. It just doesn't, unless you reduce spending and increase revenue, nothing you're going to do is going to make it any better. And they don't want to do that because of the political cost. Therefore, they're going to do something that's only going to exasperate an already bad situation. It's, it's almost the, uh, like they want to bankrupt. America and bring in this digital currency where they can control everybody by by having this. Yeah, that, that would be the ultimate thing. Even the Washington Post, when your opponents call you communist, maybe don't propose price controls. You know, this is again to her uh to her you know proposition uh it's, on her platform. This is this is crazy. But I did want to ask you guys about the Palestinian protest that has been going on. Everywhere she goes, there's Palestinian protests against Kamala. Uh, they're planning to do it at the DNC in a major way. Uh, there's backlash over their support of Israel. So they're up against the wall, even though they gave these Palestinian organizations, these Muslim funding organizations, they gave them a bow and they threw tin walls at them, where the other guy that they were going to pick was going to be uh, uh, Shapiro from Pennsylvania. They found out he served at the IDF, which is the ultimate sin, according to them. And they gave him walls, who is completely pro, uh, pro-Muslim, pro anti-Christian, anti-Judeo-Christian world. Oh, Very anti-Semitic. Yeah, pro-China, pro-communist. You name it, he is about the worst. Jacob Prash, you think they're going to continue these protests and how the Dems are going to handle this? Right now, they're limited in how far they can go because of the election. After the election, if they win, God forbid, that is when you will see changes in policy. Remember, Barack Obama was an enemy of Israel. He's an enemy of Israel. Left-wing Jews are Meshumids in, 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 in Yiddish. Uh, they're, they're traitors. They are the Menlauses. Menlauses are the, was the traitor of the Maccabees in the Feast of Hanukkah, the Benedict, Jewish Benedict Arnolds. That, that's what these Jewish supporters of the Democratic Party machine actually are. Um, people like Soros, the Jewish identity and the welfare of Israel means nothing to these people. They don't care about it. They'll fund these people who are enemies of Israel. They don't care. Um, it'll eventually catch up with them, but they just don't care. Um, this has always gone on. Um, the Rothschilds lent money to people who are anti-Semitic in the history of Europe. Um, it's always gone on. There's always been people like that. Well, it's going on now. Yes, I think these protests will continue. But I think these protests are not just about Israel. They're like what 
um, Occupy Wall Street was, like what Antifa was, like what Black Lives Matter was. It's just the next phase. It is just the next phase of an even wider um, trend. And I think that trend serves the interests of globalism. Yeah, no you doubt. Think but David, they what do you all think? Come together, Jacob. That they could all come together after the. Well, they tend to one one tends to be in vogue, then the next one comes. But what about after the election? Look, they're all progressivists. Alan Dershowitz said something very interesting, and I agree with him, even though he's a liberal Democrat. He said, "Don't confuse progressivists with liberals." any more than you should con confuse conservatives with the Ku Klux Klan. Um, their enemies might try to put them in the same basket, but they're quite different. He said he knows conservatives would be as much against the Klan as he would be. Um, well, don't put him in the same basket with progressivists. The progressivists are not liberal. They are they are fascist. They yeah. don't believe in democracy. Marxist. They Nuts. don't believe in democracy. They, 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 they're not liberal. Um, well, look what they did with uh, Kamala Harris. It wasn't, it, she wasn't elected. There was no Democrats no, at all yeah. whatsoever. They just selection and bypassed everybody who is in the Democratic Party. Of course. Now, Jacob, do you think she, I mean, she's already bending the knee uh, to the anti-Semitic group of the, of the Democratic Party by uh, saying that she's going to support not only a ceasefire, but an embargo against arms, shipping arms to Israel. So she's already there. Do you think this she is ever going to satisfy that part of the Democratic Party, the, the anti-Semitic part of the uh, Democratic Party? I mean, they got the guy that they wanted. Tim Walz is very Muslim, very pro-Muslim. Uh, but is that enough? No, she'll go further. She, she, if anything, she will go further. Let's remember something. Donald Trump said correctly, any Jewish person who votes Democrat ought to have their head examined. Well, he's absolutely right. Why did she not choose the governor of Pennsylvania, Shapiro? He would have been a much more viable candidate. He would have drawn more moderates and centrists and independents to vote for it. But she went to, to somebody as far to the left as she is. Yeah. Why? This is because he was a Jew. Because he was a Jew. Well, what else? Walls. Walls endorsed Ulmert, a vehement, radical anti-Zionist from the squad who's an anti-Semite. An anti-Semite. And he endorsed her. And yet there are Jews stupid enough to vote for her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're going to learn. I mean, if you're going to steal an election, do you really need to worry about who you choose for your vice president? Yeah. Wow. That might get us banned. <laughs> uh, Jacob, why is RFK trying to endorse her to get some kind of political uh, cabinet position? Uh, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Well, let's remember, although he's, he's more moderate and he says valid things about the deficit and about COVID, he's still a liberal Democrat. Right, right. But they treated him like garbage, basically. They did. Yeah, but he's still bending the knee. Of course he did. What else is he got to do? He, he can't go to Trump. <laughs> he can't, yeah, I know. He, he's he going to go. He Trump did speak at the Independent. Not only uh, that, but, but Biden and Harris, well, the, Biden withheld secret service protection from him. Yeah. So yeah he's JFK's true. nephew and RFK's son. Even yeah. though his uncle as president was shot dead and his father while running for president was shot dead, they... The Democratic Party administration refused him Secret Service protection. Not that it would have done him much good. I mean, yeah. they, had, they had a Secret Service agent. She <laughs> brought her family with her while she was supposed to be <laughs> on duty protecting the president. And she she left without consent to, to, to breastfeed her baby. This is a woman supposed to be protecting the... <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> Secret Service needs to be just made to invest, yeah, counterfeiters and 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 be replaced. Yes, I, I agree. They should get former special forces and, and seals and people like that and make a different agency. The Secret Service is too much of a joke. Yeah, yeah. Nothing has been more shameful than evangelicals for Harris. Literally, they have lied. They have literally lied about it. 
Now they launched this campaign to support her because they say better she better reflects Christian values than Trump. I don't know which values they yeah, say. Yeah. A, you go a to baby at forty weeks gestation, irreversible gender reassignment surgery for for underage children. Of course she does. That is yeah. their evangelical values. The first <laughs> thing they have lied about is being Christian. Yeah. If you yeah, look at the the politics, they're, they're, they're using the church as a political platform to campaign for compensation yep. payments to black people. Yeah. Uh, as if they, they they were the actual slaves or something. I mean, it's, this is what they are. These people are not in any biblical sense Christian. Yeah, reflection of Christian values. So this is Cornerstone Baptist Church, Pastor Dwight McKitsick, uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, the Park Church in North Carolina, Gordon Conwell Seminary. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Some are well known, some are not well known, uh, but they literally have it on the website that she reflects the, the the Christian faith as an evangelical. We have to love our neighbor. She loves her neighbor and all this stuff. It, it's just it's just nonsense, complete crazy. Her favorite verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight, because she says we don't know everything, and so we have to uh, just believe that God is love, and uh, and we have to just trust Him. And so this is this is on the website, and nothing about Jesus, nothing about Him dying on the cross and rising from the dead. Even Billy Graham's granddaughters come out and supporting her, uh, Jerusha Dudorf, which tells you how far things can come uh, in one or two generations. So. Yeah. I don't. I don't know where this is going, Jacob. But this is this is laughable. They're deeply committed Christian. She's a she is at best uh, a ecumenical because she went to Hindu temples. She loves Islam. She loves this. She loves that. So she's all things to all men. I love, suppose. Love, love, yeah, love, love, love. <laughs> but she went that, to this, this, Judge Carol Brown like said she's a she's into political couch casting. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That reflects Jesus' character, right? She's a yeah. slut. The woman is a slut. <laughs> and well, she's a proven slut. Um, as well, Brown's wife. Um, and, 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 and that reflects the Christian character. Yeah. Abortion well, with well, no medical grounds reflects the Christian character. Well, that tells you what Southwest Baptist Seminary has become. A cesspit that ought to close down. Yeah. Well, well, well Latasha, well, Latasha Morrison said that uh, Kamala was the embodiment I, of Christian love. And she uses the uh, used the verse out of Romans and one out of John to uh, support Romans her. one, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reading Romans one, what it well, says about this is what's happened is because we now can change words and change meanings, and then you can blame your opponent for what you're actually doing. So they they make. Trump a villain by things that they're actually doing, and so they yes. redefine. They're redefining what healthcare is. You know, it's it's you know, abortion becomes like fourth on the list, but it's included in the list of healthcare. We got to get diapers. We got to get all these things, and so they're covering abortion with all these good things, and so they say we've got to support healthcare. And so it's it's like when people support other things, you know, gender affirming uh, transition, you know, it's just you just couch it in the language and it changes what it is. We're seeing that that these pastors like I think that first one, Dwight, if my memory serves me right, he was one that is supporting abortion and he. Like you said, he came out of Southwest, but he's like one of these, like most people don't remember the Dr. Martin Luther King, who I always thought was a good man, but he worked with um, uh, early on Planned Parenthood, received the Susan, uh, not the Susan. Um, Margaret Sanger? Uh, Margaret. Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger Award, because if you read uh, some of the books, they were saying, don't be letting them know we're doing abortion. And they duped them to come in in the name of family planning and better economics and all these sort of things. So this is the way they work. They crouch, they they put the the bad thing in the middle and hide it behind all their flowery yes. language and change 
the meaning. They've changed the meaning of what these people are as evangelicals. They've changed what Christianity is. They've changed all this. But unfortunately, we have a church that is has very little doctrine, very little discernment, and very few know what's going on. And this is not just America. This is worldwide. Yes. Who are the greatest idols that the Democratic Party and their establishment promote is, of course, abortion on demand up to full term, uh, yeah. up to birth. The other one is mutilation of children, which is, they call it the uh, the trans and gay policy. Now, the, this these two idols, these two idols are, they have two priests. You know, the priest is this Kamala and the other one is Tim Walls. And they are leading people down this road. But why is the church into this stuff? Jacob, why are this church so far into this idolatry that they have to have child mutilation and child murder? It's exactly what happened to Israel before the Bab uh, Judah before the Babylonian captivity, and Israel before the Assyrian captivity. How could the people of God, how could even the temple priests, the Levites, be doing those things with yeah. the idolatry and the immorality, and even mimicking their enemies, the pagans from Babylon and so forth, and Assyria? How could they have done it? Well, it, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10 and in Romans 15, the things that were written were written for our instruction. Go look what happened when Israel and Judah did these things. And that is what is happening to the Western world. Yeah, to the Western church. So. Uh, go read that book, Shepherds for Sale. Judgment, isn't it, Jacob? Yep. Go yep. read that book, Shepherds for Sale, Megan Basham. It talks about how the They're left. Going to Babylon, Babylon yeah. the Great. How the left has really brought into a lot of money. A lot of money. If you haven't read it, go read it. It's, uh, yeah, it's, there it is right there. And uh, they traded the truth for the leftist agenda. Not saying that there's not traitors on the other side, too, who bypass everything and they want to go for political agenda either. But by far, this is, uh, this is they're literally trading in children's death and mutilation and women's death and mutilation over the fact that they need to have these two priests priestess and priest. And uh, of course, this is where it's going to end up. They're going to end up in Babylon in the judgment of God. And by the way, yeah, that, book, uh, that book has made a lot of pastors really angry. So you can kind of tell who's yeah. uh, who's on the payroll and who's not. Uh, uh, they're really, really they're getting paid, man. They're uh, getting paid. I'm billionaires or billionaires are funding these programs and the infiltration of these pastors. Yeah, it's been going on for some time, but now the, yeah. it's spilling out. It's spilling out. Go ahead, Jay. Where are all the good leftists that were complaining about the separation of church and state? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I seem to recall that that was a big that was a that was a big issue for them. We shall all be one. <laughs> I'm very happy with religion as long as you have a Desmond Tutu yeah. who wants to ordain lesbian priests no. in the in communion. But if this you have a conservative. Bible believing Christian, then they're against it. Yeah. And they want you to keep it in your head, like in England. Don't don't say it out loud. Just keep it in your Correct. head. Pray, pray, just pray in your head. Don't say anything. You know, and even that, it gets, you know, thought police comes in and then uh, it tries to come after you. So yeah. anyway, we're, we're gonna shut it down right there. We're gonna go to backstage because we have a um a very important topic. Uh, which is uh, a deadly strain that's going on in the world. We're not allowed to say it here, so we have to go on backstage. So we won't be on Facebook, we won't be on YouTube. We'll be on the other platforms, uh, of course. Uh, but we're going to talk about what may come. A uh, deadly strain is coming, let's say, from Africa, and it's going to impact the whole world, according to the CDC and the WHO. So let's figure that out. So come with us the backstage with Jacob Prash and the group here. So we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Hello, and thank you for watching Moriel TV. There are so many things that are happening at Moriel Ministries worldwide, from the Philippines to Japan, to India to Africa, and back to Europe and the United States. So many of our brothers and sisters are spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to this lost world. We are so thankful for your prayers. God has been faithful and has blessed us in so many ways. If you'd like to partner with our efforts abroad and at home, please take a moment to click the link in the description and help us as the Lord leads you. Thank you very much and God bless.